Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Candace Bradbury Carlin. I'm the director of the Chilton Library, which you're sitting in. I'm going to introduce you to Barry. So when we were trying to plan a, a program for March that we thought would be would um, you know be appealing to people, um, the first person I thought of was Barry, because he if you haven't seen him talk before, he he really tells a wonderful story as you get old preview from. And he told me something that I didn't know, which was that Little Women, the 1994 movie, was filmed in Old Deerfield. So he'll tell you more about that. So, um, so I'm really thrilled to have Barry here and to have you here to experience this with me because it's such a treat. And with that, I'll bring you Barry Dietz. Thank you. <laughs> all right. First of all, thank you for coming out. Again, it's a gorgeous day. But I'm glad you came in here, and I want to make sure everyone can see. I'm not going to put anything crucial up here, and there'll be no maps or anything like that, but I do want to make sure everyone can see everything. If I'm in your way, say, Barry, move. That can happen, too. Um, but I thank you so much. Thanks, Candace, for having me here, and let me be a part of this. And, uh, and so I want to start out with a small, my own relationship to little women. I've got a bunch of books up here I'm going to talk about later to give you kind of an overview. This is, this is the extended footnote that will come at the end of the talk. But every one of these books... Starts out with the writer telling you the story, and it's the same story. When I was a little girl, my mom gave me Little Women. It was her grandmother's edition of Little Women, and I read it, and you know the story. It's a great story. I love stories like that. I live, I'm a librarian, I live for stories where people tell me their life was changed or galvanized or fired up in some kind of way because of a book somebody put in their hand. I love that kind of story. But let me tell you, when I was a kid in school, I'm not going to read a book called Little Women. I'm just not going to do it. I was a sports guy. I ran track. I played football. I was not, and you know, it's being, as, a, as a kid like that, being caught with a book already was trouble. You can't read a book called Little Women. And I got to tell you on that note, Little Men's even worse. Right? Oh, Barry's over there reading Little Men. So, no, I never read Little Women growing up. I never read it until I was an adult. And even then, I was tricked into it. In 2004, I was working in North Carolina at a bookstore called Quail Ridge Books and Music. And, out, and, and nearby, just you know, 45 minutes away, was Duke University. Duke University had just plugged millions of dollars into building a new theater complex, a training stages, and a huge auditorium for Broadway show debuts. And they created what they called the Broadway Show Workshop. And the idea was, you'd bring your show that's headed to Broadway to the university, they would let you use the facilities to fine tune it. This is always something Broadway shows do. You know, you go out of town, you run it for a little bit and see the bugs and stuff like that. So that's what Duke was offering. Their facility to get the show into shape before you head to Broadway. So in 2004, Little Women came to Duke University to go through this with the idea of heading to Broadway in 2005. So what they wanted to do was let some folks know that this was going on. And so they called the bookstore where I worked and talked to our PR person. Quail Ridge was extremely busy. We had readings almost every night. There was lots of stuff going on. It was a big, very well-known bookstore. And they said, we are sending around the writer of Little Women to do programs, and we'd like to do one at your bookstore. Now, you can't see it, but right here it says, Book by Alan Nee. Come on in. Um, the way a Broadway show is set up, of course, is you have songwriters, lyricists, and, song, and, and composers. You have a choreographer, and then there'll always be a line on the marquee for the play that says book by. The book is everything else. That's the man who put together the, the actual dialogue and the stage directions. Usually it's a playwright. So Alan Nee was a playwright, and they were sending him around to talk about the new Broadway show. He was going to talk about the classic book and how it became a Broadway show musical. Well, the woman who answered the phone said, well, you know, we got a guy here who does programs on writers. And so why don't we do a program where he talks about how she came to write the book, and then your guy can come in and talk about how you take a book and turn it into a Broadway musical. So I walk into her office and she unfolds all of this for me. 
She's like, so you're going to talk about Louise M. Alcott and how she came to write the book, and then he'll come, he'll come up, he'll get up and talk about the play. And I'm sitting here thinking, this is a great idea. This is a fabulous idea. I've never read Little Women. And I don't know anything about the story or about the writing of it. So that's how it happened. So I went out and bought the book, and I was spellbound by it. I went in with all kinds of wrong ideas about what it is, you know. And we do that, especially, I think, with young adult and children's books. You know, we go in thinking, you know, I was expecting an extremely sentimental story. And yet what I found was a very powerful story about girls, about young women, about survival. And a line I particularly remember the mother saying at one time, she tells her daughter, I have been angry every day of my life. What a stunning line. I had not expected that at all. And so that's where I got my interest in Little Women. And so what I want to talk about is, is a little bit of her life and a little bit of her work. And I want to start out with just this wonderful image of her. She was dark. And this was something that her father was always telling her about. The other three daughters were blonde hair and the ringlets, you know, and concerned about their beauty and all of that. And just looking at Louisa, you see someone different right off the bat. I want to quote a wonderful letter that she wrote to her father. She was born on her father's birthday. So every year they had the same birthday that they would often celebrate it together. And when she was 23 and he was 56, she wrote a really extraordinary letter to him. And I want to read it to you because a lot of what I'm going to talk about is the relationship. This is her father, Bronson. Oh, Bronson Alcott. We will get to Bronson Alcott. But um, so this is a letter she wrote. I think it is but right and proper that on thanks at a Thanksgiving feast should be held in the States where both are to celebrate the joyful day in which two such blessings as you and I dawned upon the world. And I pleased myself with imagining how differently we looked and acted on making our debut upon the stage we have, where we have been acting our parts so well ever since. I know you were a serene and placid baby, looking philosophical right out of your cradle at the big world about you. I was a crass, crying baby, bawling at the disagreeable old world. I scrambled up into childhood, fell with a crash into girlhood, and continued falling over fences, out of trees, uphill, downstairs, tumbling from one year to another till strengthened by such violent exercise, the topsy-turvy girl shot up into a topsy-turvy woman. And now, 23 years after, she sits big, brown, and brave, crying not because she has come into the world, but because she must go out of it before she has done half she wants to. And because it's such hard work to keep sunshiny and cheerful when life looks gloomy and full of troubles. But as the big brown baby fought through its small trial, so the brown woman will fight through her big ones and come out queen of herself, though not of the world. Louisa May Alcott at 23. And, and how old was her father? 56. 56. Yeah. No, no, no. She was, she was second. second. The, first, the first daughter um, was Anne, Anna. And uh, yeah, let, let me back up a little bit and tell you about them. Uh, because this is her father, Bronson Alcott. He was, he was actually, his given name was Alcox, which he didn't like. Didn't think it had any oomph to it. So he and his brother actually cooked up Alcott. As Alcott, sounding as a little bit better. He was a philosopher. He was a thinker. He was an extraordinary man and a little bit crazy. And he may be one of the most radical men of the era. When he started a school in Boston, it was called Temple School because they used a Masonic temple for his school. He was extremely radical in how he went about it. He, there was none of this spoil the rod thing. You know, there was none of this uh, uh, brutalization that was so much a part of education, the rote learning that was so much a part of how you learned anything in those days. He talked to the kids. He even published conversations he had with the children. This is going to get him in a lot of trouble later on. But the whole concept of listening to children and talking to them, he became very well known for that. And one of the men he made a very good friend of is Ralph Waldo Emerson. Emerson said that Bronson Alcott was the most brilliant speaker 
he had ever heard. Unfortunately, when he tried to write all this down, it became crazed gibberish. And, uh, and that was really how he was viewed. For most people, he was someone who just could not seem to make any, he just didn't make any sense. He was the kind of the spoof of the philosopher, right? Mouthing off airy thoughts that no one could follow. But Emerson believed in him and became fascinating when several times in his life, uh, Emerson is going to step in, as he often did. Ralph Waldo Emerson is the towering father figure of transcendentalism. Not only does it really begin with him, I mean, beginning with nature, published in the 1830s, but Emerson will be a real guide. He will encourage people to come to Concord and live and settle. And it really is an extraordinary thing. I want to um, show you, I'm going to jump just a little bit ahead of my picture, so stay up. Things are going to blick by you. That's okay, though. I want to quote from this book right here, American Bloomsbury, about, this is, this is a vision. She's talking about the three houses here in Concord where Emerson lived and where um, Thoreau lived and where the Bronson Alcott came to live when, when Emerson encouraged him there. And so she writes, this is Susan Cheever, at various times these three houses were home to Ralph Waldo Emerson and his family, Henry David Thoreau, Bronson Alcott and his daughter Louisa May, Nathaniel Hawthorne and Margaret Fuller. Their neighbors were Henry James and his father, Emily Dickinson and Oliver Wendell Holmes, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and Horace Mann. Their friends were Walt Whitman, Herman Melville, Henry Ward Beecher, and Edgar Allan Poe. Wow. Well, that just about covers it, doesn't it? I mean, that's everybody. She goes on to say, from their collaborations with each other and the Concord landscape came almost every 19th century American masterpiece. Walden, The Scarlet Letter, Moby Dick, and Little Women, to name a few. As well as the ideas about the women, of men, women, nature, education, marriage, and writing that shaped our world today. They don't call it the American Renaissance for nothing. It was a golden, extraordinary age. It was people coming together. You know, we have this concept of genius clusters. You know, the idea of the, the Renaissance or the, the Impressionist painters, or this notion that certain people come together in a certain environment and they bounce off of each other. They trigger each other, they inspire each other. And in a lot of ways, Concord was very much about that. So in 1840, after the school had closed, oh yeah, the school. So Boston and his, uh, um, Alcott is in Boston with his wife. He's, he's named, a, he, he married a woman a little bit beyond him. Uh, and you know, she had come from a fairly well-to-do family. She had a lot of connections in Boston. And uh, her name was Abigail May, everyone called her Abba. And, uh, and she had quite a row to hoe being married to a philosopher. Uh, they would have four children together, Anna, Louisa May, um, Lizzie, the young girl, and then finally um, May, who becomes an artist. And so he owns the school, and initially all these wonderful ideas about education that I talked about earlier went over really well. And then he added a black girl to the school, and everyone pulled the children out. And so, the school closes, and he's back in trouble because Bronson Alcott has a hard time sticking with things and coming up with things to make money. As one of my professors used to say, he was completely feckless, that is to say, a man with no feck whatsoever. <laughs> uh, absolutely, he just, he just could never seem to make things work. All of their lives would be a tremendous amount of struggle. And a great case in point of what happens when you try to live a little too much with your philosophy is Fruitlands. Okay, so remember those theories of education which were really, really striking and innovative and radical? A lot of other people were fascinated by that. And Alcott gets a letter from a man named Charles Lane who has started a school in England called, oh my God, Alcott School. He is using Alcott's theories of education and has started a whole school. Well, Emerson, God bless him, provides the money to allow Alcott to travel to this school in England. He sees what's going on, so they all come back and they're going to put these philosophical ideas 
into play. There was something in the water in this area and in this era about the commune, the idea of coming together. There's New Harmony and there's the Oneida community and there's Brook Farm that Hawthorne went to. You know, this was very much in the air. And so they go to a place called Harvard, Massachusetts, and they rent out this farm. Now, you can go do this. It's a great field trip to go to Fruitlands, and, and they've, they've redone everything like this. But the idea was that they would not participate, anything, participate in anything that involved slave labor, and they would eat no food that involved the death of an animal. They would eat nothing that grew under the ground, only stuff that grew up in the light of God. And so, as Emerson would say, where they're doing fine in July, let's see how things are in December. Yeah, well, by December, they're all starving to death. Because part of the problem is, remember Charles Lane, the guy with all the, you know, the British guy? He and Alcott decide they're going to leave and go recruit new people and proselytize about their new theory of harmonious living. Well, while they do that, the other people left behind are under no guidance whatsoever. And it was a strange crew. Let me share with you some of the people who were hanging out at Fruitlands. There was Samuel Bauer, who was a nudist, who believed in complete expressivity of the human body. There was Joseph Palmer, who was a, and I'm quoting how they called him, this I didn't make this up, the hirsute rebel, <laughs> who believed in hairiness as much as possible. Apparently he was quite a guy. There was Abraham Everett, the schizophrenic. One description of him said antics that would have sent him to a lunatic asylum if, as an unregenerate wag once said, he had not already been in one. <laughs> and then there is, there is the, um, the young lady who just had had a little too much. You know, I mentioned there was no meat or anything like that. So a young woman who has joined the group, her name is Miss Jane Gage. Now, one of the reasons we know so much about this is in 1873, Louisa, who was 10 at the time, wrote an account of what this had been like. Now, this, you know, this is long after kind of the heyday of, of the transcendentalists. It was okay to look back with a little bit of humor and laughter at them right now. She writes a piece called Transcendental Wild Oats. And I want to quote what happened to this woman who decided she just was going to have to do something to get a little bit of protein in her life. Sleep, food, and poetic musings were the desires of dear Jane's life, but she shirked all duties as clogs upon her spirit's wings. Any thought of lending a hand with the domestic drudgery never occurred to her, and when to the question, are there any beasts of burden on this place? Mrs. Lamb, and this is Abba, this is Louisa's mom, replies, yes, there's only, she said, no, there's only one woman. <laughs> and the buxom Jane took no shame to herself, but laughed at the joke and let the stout-hearted sister tug on alone. Unfortunately, the poor lady hankered after the flesh pots and endeavored to stay herself with private sips of milk, <gasps> crackers and cheese and on one dire occasion she partook of fish at a neighbor's table. One of the children reported this sad lapse from virtue and poor Jane was publicly reprimanded by Timon, who is Charles Lane, right? The British man who's come over. I only took a little bit of tail, sobbed the penitent poetess. But the whole fish had to be tortured and slain that you might tempt your carnal appetite with that one taste of the tail. Know ye not, consumers of flesh meat, that ye are nourishing the wolf and tiger in your bosoms. <laughs> so yes, by December they're starving to death. And things are going bad. So finally, Abba, you know, the children's mother, has had enough and so she tells Bronson, you know what, I'm taking the kids and I'm leaving. And you can stay here if you want, or you can come with us or whatever. So she does that. And eventually, Bronson, who went through a huge depression over this, he feels like it's the failure of everything he's tried to do. This was a pattern with Bronson Alcott. But finally, you know, he finally realizes that, that you know, he's got to come back to his family and stuff like that. And who is there to help out yet again? Emerson, who gets them a place in Concord. 
for what becomes really the golden age of Louise's childhood. This really is the era she's going to write about when she goes on to write Little Women, about being children in what they called Hillside House. So they lived here for about three years, and this is where she went to school. And of course, who's her teacher in school? Henry David Thoreau. How'd you like that as your botany teacher? How'd you like to have this guy leading your field trips? Right? And that's what they did. They wandered all over Concord. It was absolutely a really wonderful time for her. She got to know Emerson. She would go to Emerson's library, and he would let her take books out of it. Thoreau was a good friend of hers. There's a wonderful quote that her cousin wrote about her during these years when she was a young girl. She could run like a gazelle. She was the most beautiful girl runner I ever saw. She could leap a fence or climb a tree as well as anybody and dearly loved a good romp. That's Frederick Llewellyn. No boy could be my friend until I beat him at a race. <laughs> and one of the things I love about, one of the things I'm highly going to plug is this documentary that was made by PBS, part of the great master series on Louisa May. And one of the things that recurs throughout the documentary is her running. You think about that, think about that. We think of it as such a cosseted era of women strapped down into, into clothes and expectations and livelihoods. And so this image of the running girl who would love to get out and move around, I think it's absolutely wonderful. I think it's the perfect thing. And so eventually though, it all comes to an end when they have to go back. They move back to Boston. And from, 48, from 1848 to 1858, these are really tough years uh, for all of them. Eventually, they're living in a, in a basement apartment. The family's all going out to work, but nobody can make any kind of money. Bronson is, is, go, is going off on speaking tours that nobody wants. He, he famously went on a six-month speaking tour, got paid a considerable amount of money, but gave most of it away during the course of the tour. And when he gets home, he has one dollar. So the whole, and we had been gone for six months and came back with nothing. And this happened over and over and over. But eventually, uh, they finally come back to Boston, back to Concord again, which I think is a place where they both, well, first of all, Emerson was in Concord. And he was always there to give a helping hand. Uh, there's a wonderful photograph here that I found. This is the next house they move in. This is Orchard House. Now, if you go to Concord today to check out the Valcott crew, you're going to go to Orchard House uh, because this is the house that they lived in during the adult. And this is the house they were living in when she writes Little Women. And there is Bronson right there and Abba and one of the daughters right there. And so these are the years, too, when she was in Boston and when they came out to contact her that she begins to write. Now, she had always written plays and skits for her kids. Though This is a classic moment in Little Women, right? The acting out of the plays. And so she begins nurturing her own creativity and writing. And really, it's a golden time to do that in the years of the 1850s and 1860s because there's been a huge explosion in, in, in publications. You know, there's lots of lots of magazines and things like that. And she learned, as so many other women learned during these years, that you know what? If you write under a pen name, say A.M. Bernard, nobody knows if you're a man or a woman, right? And so this is something that she learned early on, that she could write all because she loved what we today would call pulp stories. She loved murder mysteries and supernatural tales. And oh my God, she just, she called them blood and thunders. And she just let her imagination run. She would, they would be serials, which are great money. If you can run something through three or four episodes or, or several issues of it. And it was a golden time. Leslie's Ladies Magazine was one. And it was also a time for children's literature as well. This was Mary's Museum and Parley's Playmate, a, a, a publication from Boston aimed at children. And so she begins doing all these kind of things, but especially the big blood and thunders. And then, then comes the war. In 1861, everything in everybody's life changes. The war explodes and, and living in Orchard House in Concord, you know, the women begin working on, you know, knitting socks and sending stuff to send to the troops. But Louisa wanted to do more. Again, the restlessness, the running girl. 
She always wanted to be more involved in stuff. And so she decides really quite extraordinarily that she is going to volunteer to be a nurse at a hospital. So she goes to Washington, D.C. to volunteer as a nurse. And it could not have been worse timing because she did this right after the Battle of Fredericksburg which was a catastrophic, 63 was a bad year for the Union. You had Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, two of the worst battles of the, of the war. Tens of thousands of wounded all come pouring into the hospital where she is. And so she begins taking care of them. It's an extraordinary moment for her. I mean, think about it. A woman, and again, it comes back to the kind of sealed up ideas we have of, of people. Suddenly she's at a hospital where men are, have their, their legs blown off or they've been through kind of surgery and she's having to help doctors hold them down and get the, get the wrappings on and talk to them and very often tell them, you know, with the doctor, you know, the doctor that thinks you may not survive. She's writing down letters to home, all these kind of stuff. And she gets sick. She catches typhoid fever. And they treated it at the time with what was called calomel, which is basically a, 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 a concoction that has mercury in it. Now, you don't want mercury in your body. The human body doesn't secrete mercury. So if you ever take anything with mercury, that mercury will stay there forever, usually collecting in your joints. It becomes extremely painful. So this brief little episode of her life, about six weeks working at a hospital and another two months coming home sick, is really going to have consequences to her health, but it also had consequences to her creativity because she writes hospital sketches. This is the first book that really gets attention. And it's an account, one of the few we have, of a nurse being in the Civil War, telling about what she's seen. It allowed her to tap into her, her descriptive capabilities and to see the stories that all of the men told because, of course, often it was both Southerners and Union soldiers who were in these hospitals. And so she heard a little bit of everything from everybody. And so this was a, this was a book that got a lot of attention, and I think it really, really gave her the confidence to try something bigger. And the publisher she was working with at the time, she had an editor named Thomas Niles, and, she was, and he worked with Robert's brothers. And he had been pitching the idea to her, you know, you've done really well with these short pieces, but you should take on a larger project. You should write a book for children. Well, she didn't want to do this. In fact, she says, and this is astonishing, she says, I don't really know anything about girls. <laughs> and you're thinking, well, you grew up with them. You know, but she said that that's just not the kind of story she wanted to tell. But he kept egging her on. And so finally, mostly to just shut him up, she sits down and starts writing a story about her childhood, about being with her girls. Now, I told you before that if you go looking for these things today, you're going to go to Orchard House because this is where she was living when she wrote it. In fact, her father built her a little desk that's mounted in front of the windows upstairs. If you go to Orchard House today, you can see the table that she wrote Little Women on that her father had built for her. But... The experience of being a child, all that was from the previous house. I told you about Hillside House. That's where she grew up. And I would tell you a wonderful story. It's not called Hill House now. It's called uh, Wayside. And the reason it's called Wayside is Nathaniel Hawthorne rented it after Bronson Alcott. And he detested Alcott and thought he was a crazy psychopath. And so changed the name of the place. And so that's why it's called to this day Wayside. And he lived there as well. But this is what she's going back to. She's going back to her childhood, but she uses the Orchard House architecture to create the story. So the story. So when you go to the Orchard House, you are in the rooms. She was visualizing, creating these the things with the you know, the plays being acted out and all that kind of stuff. The mood pillar that you could tell by how the pillar was said, where she was a good mood or or not to be messed with. I think we should all have mood pillows. Isn't that a great idea? I would carry it with me everywhere I go. Um, so, you know, and so you can go there and see that. And so Little Women was published just after the Civil War in 1868 in a single book. And it took off, and it's astonishing because she had no faith. And even her editor, Thomas Niles, thought it was dull. But he gave it to a cousin to read. You know, and I think so, but this is how The Hobbit was published too, you know. When Tolkien gave The Hobbit to his publisher, the publisher gave it to his you know, a 10-year-old kid. And the kid's like, and he asked the kid the question you would always ask. 
do you want the story to go on? And the kid was like, yes. You know, and so that's what happened here. This young person loved the book, so they went with it, and it just exploded. You know, and I think a lot of things came together. I think right after the Civil War, you had had so many broken families. You had had so many homes with no men. It's been pointed out that, you know, little women is a world of women. The father is gone off to the battle. And so you've got the, the women, the mother and the daughters who have to pull everything together, who have to survive on their own, who have to get along in different kinds of circumstances. And so that really is something that's, that is a powerful thing that, that I think hit a lot of people at the time. And so, they, so she continued the story. And you can see here, this is the first. It was, so it was just published the first one. In the second, you get part the second. And of course, one of the things that happened between the two volumes is letters begging her to let Joe marry Laurie, right? They've seen, they see that having been set up. You know, and, that's, and it says something, too, about how, how close the reading relationship was here between her and her, and her readers. And she got all these letters from people pouring in, wanting to know what was going to happen next. What's the, and, of course, you know, Joe, uh, Louisa, is, uh, is determined to go her own way with it, as she has always done. But, you know, when we think about that story, when we see all the different ways it's being done in movies, and I'm going to talk about some of the movies. But, um, and again, I think, too, as a guy who didn't read the book growing up, you know, and yet when I see the movies and I, and I, and I read the, the story today, you know, I can see how it must have really struck home to so many people who are still recovering from the war. And... Um, and two, just the fact that she made the sisters so very different from one another. They all had different dreams. There's one point in the book, about halfway through actually, where they talk about their dreams, what they want to be when they grow up. And you know, and in some respects, as the story unfolds, none of them get their dream. And yet they all find a place. They all find a role for themselves. This was very important to Alcott, this notion of finding a role, you know, and not having it dictated to you or just acting defiantly to get the kind of thing you want. This was something that she never let go of. And I think everyone picks up on that, especially Joe, right? Because Joe's the tomboy. Joe's the dark-headed girl. You know, it's always, and if, when you talk about so many writers who point to Little Women as something that galvanized him as a, as a child or as an early reader, it was always the fierce independence of Joe is always something that we turn to. And so when this rolls over into the movie, well, of course, you're going to have to have Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> you just got to, right? You got to have her play in the first. This was 1933 in the first really big production of Little Women. And it was, it was really huge. And, of course, Catherine Hepburn plays Job. And it kind of it rebooted the story. And you'd think that with the literature, I mean, this book has never gone out of print. I mean, in fact, almost all of Alcott's books have stayed in print. Even her thrillers, I'll show you, there's a, new, there's a big collection of her thrillers, which have all been discovered. Uh, at the time that she was most famous, remember that whole pen name thing? Well, the problem with that is nobody necessarily knows who a lot of these names are. And they're still suspected that there's lots of her stories out there that we just haven't quite been able to figure out. You know, who, who wrote them? One of, one of her biographers, Madeline Stern, uh, track down a lot of them you know, for her biography, but there's still a lot of things out there. And so you would think, wouldn't you, wouldn't you think, after everything I have said so far about the importance of this woman, about the importance of the story, how, how many writers and creative people are inspired by it, you think that in the 1990s, when someone wanted to, to redo this, or actually the early 80s, it would be something that it would be a no-brainer, right? Oh, sure, let's do Little Women. The version of Little Women that was filmed here in Deerfield, part of it was, the one with Winona Ryder, directed by Julianne Armstrong, took 12 years to come to the screen. When they approached every single major, major production company, they were all told the same thing. Who cares about a movie with a bunch of women? To their faces, they were told this. It took them 12 years to get this version of Little Women made. That's how, you know, that's, that's, how, that's how much of a struggle it still is, right? You know, to step in and to tell women's stories, I think. 
you know, and, uh, and so this was filmed, the opening sequences in particular um, were filmed in Deerfield. So when you see the opening sequence in the church, the big church there in, on the main drag in historic Deerfield, and, uh, and the house, which actually wasn't filmed there, but they did a wonderful recreation of it. The film was also, they filmed a lot of it in Vancouver and in, in Canada as well. And this, of course, is the Orchard House that is from the, from the movie. And, um, and there's something really, one of the things that I am often asked is, you know, because I, be I used to be a film critic for many, many years, and, uh, and I love historical film. I love, you know, I love something set back in the past, you know. And what's, what's the allure of that? You know, some people are like, well, that's just, that's just old, or that's back, or stuff like that. And, and I think that this, these kind of recreations of how people lived, especially something as meticulously done as this version was, um, really tell us something very important about how people survive. I think there's a conscious notion that, that somehow we're different that we're struggling with things that people before us have never had to struggle with, that we're having to deal with issues of identity and gender equality and uh, who you are and what the meaning of life is, you know? And that's just, that's not true. Every generation has dealt with that kind of stuff. One of my favorite, favorite quotes I came across years and years and years ago was a man who his dying wish was that his words would be put on his tomb. And he said that, um, that life is so much struggle and we constantly strive to find out who we are. But if we just keep our hearts open and our minds open, we can find guidance. We can find a way to the meaning of life. It's not complicated. Have friends. Have someone you love. Have people around you. Find ways to be creative and, help your, and find your own way. Do you know what that was written on? It was written in hieroglyphics on a 3000 BC tomb. The meaning of life has not evaded us. It is not difficult to understand the things that matter, okay? 5,000 years ago, this guy figured it out, okay? We've always known that. And so when we turn to stories, this is one of the things we're looking for. You know, I grew up with one sister. <laughs> you know, I didn't have a lot of sisters in my life. You know, but I've known people who did or people who had all brothers. And the kind of negotiation you have to do with that is really important. And also, the, the significance of family. Think of children's literature in general. Or even a book, and particularly up to, say, the, 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 you know, the 1940s or 50s. The early versions of stories that we get. And even, even up to like Harry Potter. Home's the place you escape from, right? Or you have all these orphans, right? That's the classic story of a children. It's some sort of orphan. Dickens gives you orphans, you know. Um, the Wizard of Oz, there's always this notion of the, the happiness can only come by getting away. Even Harry Potter is only able to cobble together a family from his friends, not from the home where he's living, you know. And so... One of the things that makes this story particularly resonant, I think, is that it's about finding happiness with your people at home. Finding ways to live with the people you have to live with, you know? In some ways, the easy story is the getaway story, the story of the runaway, the story of the person who just took off and was able to get away from everything. That's the easy story to tell. The tough story to tell is staying home and making that kind of thing work reconnecting, you know, and this happens over and over and over. The fights between the characters, most famously, you know, between Amy and Joe, you know, and at one point, because Amy burns one of Joe's writings, you know, just an, an appalling betrayal. And later on, she's out, Amy's out skating on the ice, and, she, and the ice breaks under her, and she falls in, you know, and Joe's first impulse is to just leave her. <laughs> what do I owe her? You know, and then afterwards, of course, she has to deal with the guilt of that, the guilt of what she was feeling, you know. And in some ways, let's face it, you know, these, kind of, these types of things, dealing with your brothers and your sisters and your parents, this is what teaches you how to deal with these things later on. There's no altercation with another human being you didn't get at 10 that you're going to see again. Somehow, some kind of way, that kind of thing happens again. And Louisa May was there 
to tell these kind of stories and to tell them for children in particular because after the huge success of Little Women, this would be primarily what she did. Now, she did write other novels. She wrote a, an early novel called Moods and a later novel called Work um, where she incorporated in Work uh, the characters of uh, Thoreau and Emerson as the two love interests, the kind of, you know, the, the pull of the man of action, the young, fiery, uh, you know, guy who lived in a hut. And, uh, and the educated and um, elegant Emerson. So she, she pulled all of her, her life, gets pulled into her stories. That's why we love writers, isn't it? Isn't that the question we always ask, right? How much of that's your life? How much of that's autobiographical? Is any of it? Is none of it? You know, and the answer is yes and no. You just, you just use what's there, or you change it if you have to. You know, Thomas Wolfe once said, you know, you'll, I'll turn over a whole town of people just to create one character that I want, you know? And um, so I want to talk about uh, one of the things that we've seen is lately is a tremendous resurgence of Little Women. I know four versions of Little Women that's been done over the last couple of years. Uh, I want to particularly recommend this one from Masterpiece Theater. Um, it's a two-part adaption. It's, it's about three hours long, so they really took time, you know? So it really has the feel. I thought they did a really, really good job of sticking to um, the original story. And that's one of the more recent versions I thought that I thought was really good. And the books are still coming out. Uh, just back in, the, I think, 2008, 2010, this, Little Women Abroad, when the Alcott sisters, when Louisa May went with her uh, youngest sister, who was an artist, a very skilled artist, and they went and studied in Paris, um, and um, she actually would have some of her paintings in the Paris Salon, where they got a lot of attention, and her stuff's really, really, really interesting. And so... And so they kept journals as they made those trips. And so those were just published within like the last 10, 10, 15 years. So, so you know, we're still learning, learning more and more about her and about what happened to her, too. I mentioned early on when she was at the hospital that she got, you know, mercury poisoning. But there's speculation about other things. One, one doctor, this comes up in the documentary, noticed that uh, the symptoms she had were not the symptoms of mercury poisoning. And he points to this picture. One of the reasons I wanted to show this book is not only because it's a great book, but because the painting there, this is Louisa May on the end. And you can see there's the, uh, the, 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 the pink cheeks and the nose. That's called the butterfly. And it's a symptom of lupus, apparently. And, uh, and so there's much speculation now that she may have had lupus. Uh, she got extremely, she, she herself would lament the fact that by the time she had finally got some fame, she'd lost most of her health. You know, she wasn't able to move around so much. She continued to write ferociously. I mean, her productivity was just absolutely incredible. She was an editor. She edited a children's book. She had lots of other things that came out. And, uh, but she stayed at it all of her life, but she got very sick. And her father and her were sick at the same time. And uh, astonishingly, they died within two days of each other. And uh, absolutely, absolutely. Her father had died and she had gotten, they think she may have had a stroke because she just kind of was having an awful headache. And so they had taken her to kind of a, a, a home where she could recover. And uh, while she was there, her, her Bronson died. And then two days later, she passed away. And she is buried at Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Concord. Now, about five or six years ago, the church I go to, uh, uh, the UU's at Berniston, we went on a field trip, and we went on a field trip to Concord, and it was really wonderful. And so we went to, to this gravesite, I mean, to this graveyard, which where everyone's there. I mean, you know, everyone who's everybody. Uh, Hawthorne's buried there, Emerson's buried there, uh, Thoreau's buried there. Um, and then you come to the Alcott family. She's buried here. The whole family's buried here. You have this big giant thing that lists everybody. And then there's this thing with Louise's name. And it's covered in pins. Now, when I was there, there was a stack, a huge stack of pins. And when you think about the way to acknowledge an inspiration, when you think about a way to thank the person who has helped you in some kind of way, get through trouble or find a way out of something you think you're stuck in or find a way to creativity when you think of all the kind of tributes you could do to that, you know, you could think someone could have left a manuscript, right? Or could scribble a poem and leave that. I think it's marvelous. People leave pens. You leave the tool.
of the transformation. You leave the tool that opens up things. I think that's marvelous, and I think it's astonishing that that just sort of happened. It just sort of happened that Louisa May Alcott's gravesite, people leave pens. And it's a reminder, too, how we need storytellers. You know, because a great storyteller doesn't tell their story. Sometimes they tell your story. They hand you your story back to you. That can be scary. It can be enlightening. It can be freeing. That's, that's what, that's what, and that's what we do. That's why we turn to stories. And that's why when we, when we think about the storytellers that have hooped for us, like I said on these books, all of these books, all of them, they all begin with the author telling you about how little women came into their life. How this story starts my story. Because that's what we turn to them for. And so I want to share a couple of things at the end. First of all, <laughs> Louisa May unmasked. This is the blood and thunders that she loved to do, including a story that has an interracial relationship, a story that has hashes being used, an astonishing thing because of that wonderful, wonderful pseudonym, right? You know, because that's so, that's so necessary sometimes. You have to find, sometimes you have to shift to other genres. There's a wonderful writer in the same era in the 1880s, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, wrote a story called The Yellow Wallpaper. Now, she was dealing with deep, deep depression from postpartum depression. She was suicidal and she was bad. Now, could she have written an article about what it's like to be a woman in this circumstance? No. No one's going to publish anything like that. But what she could do is tell a ghost story about a woman who's had a child and is recovering in a room with yellow wallpaper. And she's convinced that there's someone on the other side of the wallpaper trying to get out of her prison. Gene Roddenberry knew this in Star Trek. In the 1860s, you can't tell a story about race unless you make one of the people blue or green and set it on another planet or on a spaceship. Storytellers find ways to tell the stories that need to be told. And Louisa found a way to tell the stories she loves. No one knows who A.M. Barnard is. It's just, that's just a name. And it's significant that the editors didn't care either. Her editor knew she was a woman, but he also knew nobody knows. And so for a lot of women in the late 18th century, 19th century, this was a way to get into writing. No one's really going to care. You know, you could get paid and you could make it. And she made a lot of money. She would make three or $400 off of some of these cereals. That's a big chunk of money at the time. I want to plug this documentary. Uh, Louisa May Alcott, The Woman Behind Little Women. Uh, absolutely magnificent. It tells the story of her life. Uh, Elizabeth Marvell plays her, and she's just absolutely, absolutely terrific. So they talk to a lot of, you know, the talking head thing. They talk to a lot of scholars and stuff like that. But it's just it's really, really, really well done. Um, the Library of America keeps Alcott in print. Uh, there's one volume that has Little Women, Little Men, and Joe's Boys, which is the original trilogy. But also a collection that has Work, Eight Cousins, Rose and Bloom. And so her stuff is out there. If you'd like to learn more about the era, I, you can't beat American Bloomsbury by Susan Cheever, which is a wonderful overview. Now, I have to howl at the title. One of the things Emerson said <laughs> in the American Scholar is about America finding its own voice. We are not going to follow the, the, the English. We are not going to follow those role models. We're going to come up with our own relation to the universe. We do not need some sort of connection to the old world. And she writes a book that has Bloomsbury in the title. Okay, we'll figure for that. Uh, because I see the point is, again, it comes back to the kind of genius cluster thing. It's just no, 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 there's a mystery to this. But certain places and certain times bring people together. And so as an account of the extraordinary world that was conquered when all those writers, the quote I did earlier came from this book, uh, absolutely terrific. 
Biographies, there's lots and lots of great biographies. Uh, Cheever, after writing this, and I would tell you that she wrote American Bloomsbury. She had been asked to do, to write an introduction to a new edition of Little Women. And that triggered the whole thing. Going back, and she went back and reread Little Women and thought about the context out of this, where the story had come from, and so she wrote that. And then she went on to write a book about Louisa May Alcott, which I think is absolutely terrific. I want to recommend a wonderful compilation. It's called The Intimate Anthology. And this has a lot of her nonfiction. It's got Transcendental Wild Oats in it. It's, it's got, it tells about her going into service, what it's like to be a drudge, what it's like to be the governess. You know, the, Charlotte Bronte told us about the governess job, worst job in the world. Well, it always was, you know, all during these years. And, uh, and plus some of her pot boilers are here too. Uh, letters, and also a lot of, there's a whole section of people who knew her talking about her. So it's a unique collection uh, of, of things I highly recommend to you. And finally, because I love them, you want to make me happy, you want to make me happy, give me the annotated edition of something. Okay, and I, I have them all. I've got a, like a row. I've got the annotated Frankenstein, the annotated Dracula, the annotated Walden. I love them. And so there is an annotated Little Women uh, hefty, hefty annotated. Uh, but it's absolutely terrific. It's by this man who also wrote a highly acclaimed biography called Eden's Outcast, John Matheson. And uh, so there's lots of great books about her out there. We keep telling the story of writers who matter to us. You always hear them talking about, well, you know, someone's due for a, a rejuvenation, you know. Nobody reads Washington Irving anymore. Maybe it's time to bring him back, you know. And, but there's certain writers, too, that keep coming back. And a lot of times it's the biographers who will trigger an interest in that. That's what you hope, anyway, that you will, you will kind of rejuvenate interest. But Louisa May has always been here. So what is happening here, I think, is just new generations are discovering her, particularly living as we are right now in a golden age of teen and young adult fiction. It is extraordinary. You cannot keep up. You know this. You ask any library, you can't keep up with what's coming out in teen fiction right now. Kids come in and they walk out, if you're lucky, <laughs> with stacks and stacks. But the publications themselves are just astonishing. We're living in a golden age of this kind of writing. And with Louisa May Alcott, we've got one of the founders of these kind of stories who says that telling these kind of stories, particularly to young girls, can help them with what they're going to face, help them with some of the decisions that have to be made. You know, and again, it comes back to why we need storytellers to give us this, to pass these things on to us. You learn about yourself by learning about other people. And you can learn the most about your life by going through someone else's life. That's what stories give us. It's what makes them so magical and powerful. And it's why we need them in a world changing as drastically and radically as the world we are in now. I find myself reading more fiction than ever. I find myself turning to stories more than ever to see people who've gone through change, to see people who've lived in worlds that's gone through transformation and thinking, you know, how did you get through it? And finding that little bit of hope because what's the ultimate, ultimate thing about stories? It tells you someone survived. J.K. Tetrison said, we need fairy tales not because it tells us dragons are real. We need these stories because they tell us dragons can be defeated. That's what stories do, and that's how we need them. So thank you for coming out and being part of the program and, and listening to me talk. Thank you.